And my name is Andre McKay. Uh, we did the, with, along with Alex, did the sake presentation uh, last year. Um, had an awesome time giving it and figured I'd jump in with Brewing Gadgets and, and share some of the gadgets that we've used. And also, uh, I invited uh, other club members to tell me the gadgets that they use and that they enjoy so that we can share them and hopefully get a lot of good ideas and, and inspiration for brewing during the uh, coronavirus. So what are brewing gadgets? So I kind of define brewing gadgets as anything used or modified to fit a single purpose. So, um, you know, if you've got a task that you're doing and, you know, there is a tool that you're using uh, that helps you out, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm considering a brewing gadget. Um, it can be purchased. So, you know, going out and buying something for a specific task or building something. You know, if you want to go and, you know, a, a commercial gadget that's out there isn't necessarily working for you or needs to be tweaked. So, you know, you basically build it yourself and, and solve your need by generating the tool that you need. Uh, they can be large or small. Uh, there's some gadgets in that we're going to be talking about that are extremely small. Um, and then there's some that are, you know, huge. So a brewing gadget can be big or small. It doesn't necessarily have to be a handheld tool. Uh, for this presentation, I divided it into three sections. Uh, we got a lot of different uh, suggestions from other people as to um, different processes they were doing. So I figured it made sense to break it down to the brewing and cleaning, um, since usually as you're brewing, you're kind of cleaning as you go along, so you don't have a big mess at the end. Uh, so I'm covering cleaning, product, cleaning gadgets in that section. Um, and then fermentation, and lastly, conditioning and serving, uh, including you know kegging, bottling. So let's get started, and let's uh, first up, we'll talk about the brewing and cleaning gadgets. Now this slide wasn't supposed to be in here. I I don't know what happened, Mr. Beer. That's not not a gadget we'll be discussing for this one. So brewing and cleaning gadgets, as I said, uh, you know, large or small. Uh, the hop spider is one that we're going to be talking about. Um, I know people have used it before, and and I've got some examples of that. Um, We've also got a transfer pump controller. Uh, Jacques will be, uh, that's a gadget that we've used with Jacques. So uh, we'll be talking about that. Uh, wort chiller, uh, a press. Uh, this is one of our sake specific gadgets. Uh, I didn't want to burden you guys with too much sake related stuff, but this is something that we're really proud of that we made. So I figured it was worth a, a quick mention here. Uh, carboy and keg washer. Uh, I know that in the past, uh, some people have talked about homemade ones. So we're gonna be taking a look at one of those. And lastly, the fur fur, which uh, when you guys hear about that, I think you'll, you'll be interested in what exactly that one does. All right, so first, uh, the hop spider. So uh, basically, a hop spider is something that you stick in your brewing kettle. So you can drop your hops in there, and it helps, uh, it helps alleviate the cleanup that you're going to have to do. Um, so typically, a, a gadget like this, if you were to go out and buy one, uh, you're looking at $50 to $100. Um, they can be metal, uh, metal mesh, which this example, which actually this one goes in a grain father, um, or you can use fabric bags for it. They have, you know, pre-made holders that you can stick a hot bag in it and then, uh, you know, it hangs over the side. Um, you use them for pellets or whole hops. Uh, basically it allows for good flow through. So as you're brewing, um, you end up with, with good flow around your hops. Um, and typically they have an easy cleanup on them. So homemade. Um, so this is one that uh, when we brew, we typically brew with Jacques, um, and this is one that he's made. Uh, you're looking at under for this one under fifteen dollars in in cost. So you know you can get a pre-made one or you can build your own. Uh, in this case, it's a, a large ring. Um, the one that's on there is actually the ring from a garbage disposal. Uh, so when you buy a new garbage disposal, usually it comes with all the rings and stuff to put it in your drain. And a lot of times, if you're just swapping a garbage disposal out, you won't necessarily take the old ring out and put the new ring in. So you have this brand new ring, which is perfect for this. Um, you drill uh, three holes in it and then run some all thread with some nuts so that it can basically straddle the edge of your, of your brew kettle. Um, and then you take a reusable bag and clamp that in there. So you can drop your hops in. It sits right on top of your brew kettle. And for 15 bucks, you've got your own, your own homemade hop spider. So this next one is a transfer pump control. Uh, so on uh, Jacques Brewing setup, he's got a couple of different pumps. And so this is a, a wiring box that uh, Alex did. Um, it allows for you to turn on and turn off the pumps. So it mounts on the side of, of the brewing setup. 
you run your power for your pumps into it, and then you can turn them on and off um, and control it. It's also got some auxiliary inputs for future expansion. So if we wanted to add more pumps to it, there's already the capability for it. Um, and it's also wired up with a GFCI. So in case there's some sort of, of brewing accident where you end up with, with water or liquids on the floor running where your extension cord is, it's a GFCI just like you'd have in your kitchen. So it would immediately cut the power so you don't end up standing in a, uh, in a puddle of electricity, basically. So a wart chiller is another really useful item. So when you need to cool your wart down so you can pitch, um, this is basically just a, a copper coil uh, that you run cold water through. And what it does when you drop it into your, into your brew kettle and run cold water, it takes the heat and transfers the heat out of the brew kettle through the copper coil and into the water that you're passing through it. Um, you can use tap water, depending on the time of year, or if you need to get even lower, you can run a recirculating pump and have an ice bath. So you're basically taking chilled water and running it through this coil, and it's sitting there sucking all the heat out of your brew kettle. Um, this is a, a you know, $50 to $100 gadget. Copper tends to be pretty expensive, um, and the commercial-made ones have the proper fittings on the end, so you can hook it up to your hose. Uh, you know, again, you can make your own. So this is an example of our homemade wart chiller that we made. Um, as I mentioned, copper tends to be pretty expensive. So even, you know, even for a homemade gadget, you're looking at 20 to 60 bucks in copper at Home Depot. They already have these pre-made spools. Um, this one we actually coiled a little tighter and we used a paint can so that it got a, a fairly tight shape to it. Um, and then we've just got hose clamps on the end of it. So you take your, uh, you take your water lines and hook them hook them onto the end of it. Um, in, in, in this particular homemade one, um, you got to make sure your hose clamps are tight because if they're not, you'll end up, uh, you could end up contaminating your, your cooling water, having it drip into your kettle, which probably isn't a good thing. Um, in this case, we have some long ends so it can sit over. Um, you can make these larger or smaller depending on the size of your brew kettle. This one is fairly small. Uh, when we made it, we were brewing on a, we were basically you know, brewing on a camp stove. So uh, the pot that we had was fairly small. When we do it in a larger pot, we actually take it and we move it around so that it gets some circulation in there and it, it helps, to, helps to cool everything down. So as I mentioned, you know, we, we've got one, one sake related gadget here. Um, I just thought it was, it was too good not to share with you guys. Um, so this is a press. Uh, in the sake making process, uh, you end up with a, basically a, a thick, um, it's almost the consistency of like a tapioca pudding, which is your, your rice and your koji. Um, so what you need to do is you need to end up pressing all that out. So you're separating the liquids from the solids. So for this, um, we basically repurposed a bunch of items that we had, we had available to us. Um, the main rack part of it is a, it's a holder for plastic parts bins. So like you'd have in your garage, the yellow bins, this had a bunch of rails on it, you'd hook the bins on. Um, the jack is a scissor jack from a car. Uh, we went to the restaurant supply store in Kearney Mesa um, and we got a steamer pot, uh, which you know normally if you were doing you know, big, uh, you know, lobster bake or crab boil or something. This is what you would put everything in and then put it in a larger, larger kettle so that you could then cook everything and lift it all out. Um, restaurants also use it for large quantities of pasta and things like that. Uh, the bottom part of it is a cake pan that we ordered on Amazon. Um, and then inside we've got two uh, plastic cutting boards that we routed out to fit down inside. And then we also routed channels in it. So as you sandwich two of these together with uh, your bag with, with what you want to squeeze in it and push down with a car jack, the two platters top and bottom have basically escape channels so that the liquid can then be squeezed out and pushed out to the side. So mention cleanup. Uh, so this is a, a carboy and keg washer that you can buy online. You know, there's a bunch of different versions of these. So this is just one that I picked out. Um, you're going to spend about $100 for this. Uh, you can pump sanitizer or cleaner. Um, you know, carboys and kegs can be hard to clean. You know, you either need to get in there and try and scrub them or, you know, get in there with a sprayer yourself and, and try and get it in there. Um, this basically sits, you know, you sit your carboy or keg upside down on it and then uh, turn on a pump and it sits there and it will recirculate cleaner sanitizer um, 
usually inside there's a spray ball head which then shoots stuff out in different directions so it, it maximizes the the um, water hitting all the surfaces in there and since it's recirculating you know you can fill it up fill the sump up essentially and turn it on and it will sit there and recirculate the water uh, instead of you know having it all go down the drain before you move so, on to the, the next one yeah sure we, we'll see if there's any questions because okay. I know we're yeah yeah have some other members of our club talk about some of the other ones that are coming up here sure but I noticed there's a lot of comments on the chat about um, about the uh, the chillers and so I, I don't know if there's any questions on here or people if there's anything anybody wants to talk about with it. Yeah, we can we can slide back to those. Sure. There was a lot of different things on here that people were talking about. Is there anybody that, if you've got a uh, a question that uh, you know you have on, or you want to make a statement about chillers, now would be a great time to talk about chillers. Um, just a lot of different statements about what people are doing for for chillers using pond pumps to recirculate ice water. Mm -hmm. like that. Um, these are things that are being mentioned. I don't see any questions yet or anybody that's saying, hey, I wanna, I wanna. Um, I know. got something. Sure, yeah, Nick, go ahead, Nick. Maybe he has a question here, let me, let me get. In um, just, just one of the things that it took me a while to figure out, I'm sure many of you guys already know this, but um, first of all, the pre-chiller is a great idea anytime you incorporate one, but, um, the flow rate, especially from your chillers, you have to have a way of slowing down that, uh, that outflow in order for them to be truly effective. So definitely try to incorporate something into the outflow of your, um, your chillers because it's a lot more efficient when you do that. Yeah, well, what you want to do is you want to maximize the amount of time that the liquid is flowing through the coils so that it can grab the most amount of heat possible and then pass it through on the outside. Um, when we're doing ours, uh, this particular one that's on the screen now, um, we've got a essentially a hose going on the input um, and then the output we're collecting in a large bucket that we use to water plants afterwards with it. Um, so what we'll do is we'll sit there and we'll basically you know, run the, the incoming water and adjust it so that the water on the outside is essentially as hot as we can feel it. Um, that's how we know that we're getting the most transfer through that. Um, and then as I mentioned before, actually picking it up and moving it around helps circulate the wort that you have it in so that you don't end up with essentially a cold spot. You're, you're giving it some circulation in there. Yeah, I've been using a uh, um, immersion chiller and then using uh, basically our hose water, groundwater to chill down to a certain point and then uh, using ice to basically finish it off and bring it down to the temperature that I want. Yeah, and as I mentioned, that kind of depends on the time of year, right? You know, if you're brewing in December, January, where the groundwater is going to be fairly cool, then you may not actually need to use the secondary ice bath. But um, I know that when we've brewed before and it's been, you know, the middle of summer, um, we usually do it in two stages where we use groundwater at first um, to bring it down a little bit and then we finish with ice water to get it that final little bit past what the groundwater temperature is. Yeah, same experience here that it depended on the, and it also depends on whether you're brewing an ale or a lager and you have to bring it down further with a lager. Yeah. Doing the lager in the summertime, okay, that's two bags of ice and not just one. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I've even found that um, the week prior to when I brew, um, I'll start harvesting ice out of our ice maker and bringing it to the outdoor freezer fridge that we have so that when it comes time to uh, chill, uh, I, I've got an entire freezer full of ice and ready to go. And I'll even do like an old like uh, cool whip, I'm sorry, cool whip uh, container and I'll freeze that ahead of time. So I've got this big block of ice and I, that lasts longer than some of the individual chips or, or blocks that your ice maker is going to make. Looks like Jacques got a question as well. I, I do, thanks Andy. Yeah, I wanted to find out, um, this is a traditional shape, this round coiled immersion chiller. There's a ton of different options on the web. You can find stuff that's shaped like clover leaves and every other wacko shape you can imagine. Has anybody had experience with any of those others and do they work better than this pretty simple, easy to make type chiller that I also have, by the way? 
Yeah, I use a rib cage uh, chiller and I made it, uh, I found plans online. Basically, it's like a regular work chiller, like you see in the picture here, but it's a double coil. So you basically coil going down and going back up. So you get basically twice the surface area. And, and, and does, do you find that it does faster? Uh, actually, I don't know because I never did my double chilling method with a regular coil. But this oh. works, the way I do it works really well. Because you can spread it out. It's not like it's, you see how the coil is like all contained right there? Since you yeah. have one a coil going down and a coil going up, you can pull them apart a little bit so you get better coverage within the wart, uh, the body of the wart itself. Okay. Sounds very fancy, Dan. So one of the things that I do, Google it. <laughs> uh, Jock, one of the things that I do because I'm doing immersion chilling is I will uh, recirculate the, uh, the uh, wart in the, uh, in the uh, kettle. And I'm also running uh, the uh, um, uh, water or ice through the uh, chiller at the same time. And so I'm getting more, more flow, more flow around the, uh, the surface of the, uh, the chiller and better uh, efficiency on the heat exchange. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the key is surface area, right? If you can maximize the amount of surface area of actually of, of the coil you have, or coil or shape, I mean, it doesn't necessarily need to be a coil. Um, just if you can get more loops or more bends or more whatever in whatever you're trying to cool, then you can maximize the amount of surface area that is going to suck the heat out into the water going out. So um, I, I wouldn't think that shape would matter. Um, but you know, there's probably some thermomechanical formula to, you know, figure all that out. So I just, I want to make it clear with this uh, rib cage chiller that I have in my wart, I actually agitate everything as the cool water is going through it, um, uh, rather than just let it sit static. Yeah. Uh, and I don't have a pump that'll like recirculate stuff to get everything over the coils. So, but you know, my method seems to work okay. It's just a little labor intensive for you know, a few minutes. Yeah, and, and uh, as I mentioned on this one, we take it and we, we move it around so that it's not sitting in one place the whole time. Right, right, right. Cool, so any other uh, questions or comments about the uh, chillers? Maybe we can move to the, I think, um, I forget which one, you had another another slide on here that sounded like there was some interest to it right before. Uh, yeah, the other one was the, uh, we've covered the hop spider, we had the transfer pump control, um, I talked about the uh, sake press, and then we we're on the carboy and keg washer. So, okay, that one. Anyone's got any? Okay, there may be some questions on the carboy and keg washer. Cool. Um, well, let's. Uh, so we we've got a homemade homemade example first. Uh, let's talk about that, and then if there are any questions about uh, both the uh, the retail ones or the homemade ones, we can cover all that in one shot. Sounds perfect. I think that's cool. Jacques that's going to talk about the yep. example. Perfect. Yeah. So Jacques, you're you're up. All righty. Um, so yeah, being a, uh, a, a, a do it your a crunk do it yourselfer and a uh, a regular cheap guy, I didn't want to buy that hundred dollar version. So using the tools of the Google and the tube of you, I figured out and saw how to make a a, a keg washer and carboy washer of my own using pretty simple stuff. Um, as you can see, it's a, a PVC pipe. Most think that's all half inch. Uh, a pretty inexpensive pump that I bought on the Amazon for maybe like 15 bucks. Uh, about two and a half or three dollars worth of um, tubing and a couple of connectors. Uh, a, a Home Depot bit, and that was it. And I was able to make this. Uh, keg and carboy washer that's pretty efficient. Um, I put uh, homemade PBW in the bucket to do the clean. Uh, I do a rinse, put a uh, sanitizer in next, and I do a sanitizer, and it's, it's pretty darn incredible how well this will clean some pretty nasty schmutz out of the keg and out of a carboy. So Jacques, what, how does it work? Where does it go? Does it, do you just pump it through the, the keg or do you have to put the keg over? over so so the, the two, two arms that you see going uh, uh, perpendicular to the main pipe going up the top, the keg will rest on that and on the sides of the bucket. And the top, the, uh, the, it, it all comes apart too, by the way, for easy storage. It's, none of it is glued. It's all just pressure fit and it comes apart. 
So the piece going up through the top uh, just shoots water and cleaner out the top. And as you can see, um, the piece coming off just above the, the, uh, the pump feeds through the, uh, the input and the output of the, uh, the gas and the, and the beer lines. So it cleans all of those areas out as well. So it kind of catches it all at once. And we've, we've actually got a, a video that Jacques shot that'll show this thing in action. So let's take a look at that. That'll probably answer any other questions that we've got. Yeah, the internet is, uh, is my friend. This is the homemade DIY keg and carboy washer. I'll take a picture of it when I've got the keg going, but you can see right there is the hookups that drives the liquid through the, uh, well, that's a pretty bad video. Hey, uh, gas and water ball locks to get those running nice and clean. As you can see, it's driving a pretty good stream through this. I was thinking that it would need to have more of a, a spray, but it seems that this works just dandy. I've done five or six kegs already and you get a really good spray on it. Anywho, you let that run for about five or so minutes, 10 minutes if you want to, and it'll get your stuff sparkly clean. Uh, I found that I needed to add a little bit of elbow grease to some kegs that were really old, uh, sitting around, not having been washed. Um, actually, they were. They, I thought they still had beer in them, but they were just about gone, so I cleaned them out pretty good. I'll take a picture of a keg prior to to leap to wash and, af and after. So Jacques, did you just use water or did you put any uh, later on? I, used, I put PBW in it, Dan. I put PBW in first and I do a rinse of that and then I'll usually throw a sanitizer in at the end just because I like to keep things sanitized, which I'll, you know, I'll end up cleaning it again quick before I use it in, uh, in, a, in a production beer thing. but. It, it, a little PPW doesn't hurt, and it's the it's the homemade uh, banker's style again because I don't like to pay retail. So there, are, there's a question about what the ball locks are for on the carboy. <laughs> so I think that was just the video that was showing that you could use it for a carboy or for a uh... it, exactly, and I've and I've used it for carboys as well. But you just set the carboy right on top, and it sits on there. Chris mentioned in his chat, I saw. Um, the little uh, cleaner ball that you can put in the top of that, uh, the riser, which has a million little holes and it shoots, uh, it shoots the liquid out in all directions. So it's like a disco ball of, uh, of liquid dispersion inside. It's pretty cool, but this so, is- uh, did, you find, did you find that you could- uh, to, uh, spin too. So as the liquid throws through, it spins. So those get every surface perfectly and they're real cheap. They're like 10 bucks on Amazon for a stainless spray ball. Uh, a couple of comments on my build versus this one. Uh, I use this really big sump pump that are maybe 30 bucks on Amazon. It's a huge amount of flow uh, and you can mount to that. And then for the top tube part, I do uh, threaded fittings so that you can thread on different tubes. So I've got a tube for a three gallon carboy. I've got a tube for a six gallon carboy. I've got a tube with the spray ball for the kegs. Nice. Do you find, a, uh, Jacques or Chris, do you find that you need to heat up the PBW in order for it to really be effective or do you just run it at room temperature? Well, the big pump, Pizza for you. So you let it, that first keg, I like to do a bunch of kegs at the same time. And the first keg, Me it'll too. start out cold, but you let that go for a half hour on that first keg and you'll have some nice warm PBW at like 120. And then uh, you're keeping it warm as you do all the other kegs. And I just get a pipeline going. I'll rinse a keg, throw it on there, maybe work on some other brewing projects, rinse the next one, swap, swap the kegs, rinse the, uh, post rinse. So I always do a pre rinse to keep the cleaning liquid relatively clean. And obviously, you want to do a post rinse because these are not no rinse sanitizer cleaners. And what about the gaskets? What do you mean by gaskets? Like the little washers and everything that are in the posts and the. And 
you can take them all apart if you want, Dan, and just throw them in the bottom of the bucket on this kind of a deal. Okay. Yeah. So I take I take those post what I replace those post rings every time I clean a keg. I buy a pack of a thousand for like five dollars, and for that half a penny per O ring, I don't it's have to it. worry about whether those are ever going to fail. Now buy a thousand pack for five bucks on Amazon. Send out that link because the only ones that I found are like in in uh, packs of like sets for a lot more than that. Go to McMaster Car, Dan. Uh, no, they, uh, these days, actually, Amazon has been cheaper because you don't have to pay the shipping unless you're ordering a bunch of stuff. But yeah. uh, homebrewfinds.com has lists of all the Amazon and McMaster links for those. If you go on Homebrew Finds and search Kego rings, they'll have the bulk part numbers. And you can buy a bag of 1,000 of those and never worry about whether you're going to have a leak again. It's worth doing, for sure. Good, good advice, Chris. Well, any other questions about the uh, carboy washers or keg washers? Yeah, you have a, a, really, uh, a second in the Amazon sump pump that's saying that's, a, that's what he's using as well. So, yeah. One comment on the, uh, the keg washer build. So uh, I, I have like a hybrid. I, I, I have a store-bought um, setup that I, I sort of modified. One really useful thing is I put uh, cam locks on the uh, – the main washing pipeline. So if I want to clean or rinse something that, you know, doesn't want to have a big geyser of water, I just put a cap on the cam lock fitting. And then uh, if I want to wash a keg or a carboy, I have two different lengths of pipes. And I just uh, swap them out the cam lock. Makes it really easy. Nice. Okay, cool. sounds like a useful, a useful tool that everyone should have. And yeah, definitely. Thanks, Jacques, for sharing that with us. You're very welcome, and my pleasure. All right, so uh, next up, we've got uh, Lauren, who's gonna talk about the fur fur. All right, I, I hope this is not gonna be anticlimactic after all of the conversations that we had about fur furs earlier. Um, this is, um, um, my gadget is cheap and easy, just like I like my beers. <laughs> this, this basically is a, a, an 80 cent tool that I use a lot um, for cleaning. Um, so I guess that's why it's in this category. Um, but I also use it a lot for uh, either for transferring, um, uh, anytime I'm transferring beer, or um, um, anytime I am, as an example, setting up a new line on a CO2 keg. Um, so this tool is basically uh, allows you to press the poppet on, on your quick disconnects, whether it be a, um, a ball lock or a pin lock without poking holes in your finger uh, if it needs to be for an extended period of time if you're doing some priming or cleaning. Um, and so basically what we're looking at is a one inch um, hex bolt, stainless steel. I use a quarter 20 along with a, um, um, a, a self-locking nut, I'll obviously a quarter 20 a stainless steel self-locking nut. On the top picture, you can see that if you um, screw the nut down so that it um, the, the bolt does not quite coming through the plastic self-locking portion, not nylon. Um, you press that, you just basically insert it into your quick disconnect and it self-centers on the poppet. No, no need to worry about whether you're going to hit the poppet and, and depress it or not. Um, for the, for the, I'm trying to ignore the, the chat room here. Um, the, 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 um, as you can see on the um, the pin lock, um, it doesn't stick out quite as far. So I, for that, I would use a, a inch and a quarter bolt for that one, just to make it easier to control. Um, also, you might think that a um, a round headed bolt rather than the uh, hex hex headed bolt might be more comfortable if you're using using that a lot. 
Um, but the, the, the round headed bolts um, basically get more slippery, especially if you're dealing with um, doing some sanitizing uh, with the star sand, which is, gets a little, a little bit slippery. So, so basically it's a, it's, a, it's a priming tool, it's a cleaning tool. Um, the question is maybe why in the hell did you call it a fur fur? We don't even know. It's just a name that, that got picked up. I think it's because you can use it for this and you can use it for that. And um, so like I said, it's used for rinsing, cleaning and sanitizing, purging a newly connected CO2 line to get all the oxygen out of it. Um, Priming a keg to keg transfer line so that you don't have any oxygen in that line before you before you before you um, hook it up to the the destination keg um, and and anytime you're doing any any transferring fermenter to keg as well um, pulling all the oxygen out of any lines that are either whether it's your gas line or your beer line so that's that's the fur fur so it's sort of like a reminder that you know the gadgets don't necessarily need to be expensive you know you have this simple thing that serves a purpose that is like oh why didn't i think of that sooner you know so and i think for for all of us who've gone and tried to push the poppets down with our fingers and have slipped and shoved the poppet underneath our fingernail this is definitely a, a clever clever little hack so you can avoid doing that and it's it's you know 20 cents in parts it's well, I, I it at, at Ace Hardware, I, I priced it the other day to make sure I knew exactly the uh, the size of the hardware that I'm using. Um, it was 40 cents per, but that's because you're buying them buying them one each at Ace Hardware. Um, so it's 80 cents total for one fur fur. Okay. So if we, if we bought millions of them, maybe it would be lower cost, right? Yeah, we should go in and get a get the club discount. I think. Buy it in quantity. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, Lauren and Judy. Um, all right. Uh, so next up, uh, first of all, any questions about the fervor? And anybody else? I got a quick question. So, uh, Lauren, I see in those pictures that you had the nut side down when using this. Say you were to flip that upside down and uh, do the bolt side down. How does that change the results? Well, um, the, the the reason that the bolt side is down is because it, it is self-centering. The, the bolt being a little bit recessed in the net, uh, make sure that it's centered on the, on, on the poppet, and also make sure that um, with it being centered, you have good flow past the, past the nut and, every, and, every, and everything else to get the flow through the, the, uh, the quick disconnect. You, you use it upside down when you're in the southern hemisphere. For us, sure. we'd use it right side up. So. You have to have a, a good response to my smart ass remark. Sorry. <laughs> I have a question. How hard would it be to spot weld one of the, a fur fur to a a standard like stainless steel or or other material ring, so that you could have it like on your ring finger? Like you ever see the beer openers that you have the beer opener on it? Yeah, you pop it absolutely. You can just absolutely. always have it there ready. Wow. Well, if you know if you know anybody who does good um, stainless steel welding, let me know because I have something else I need fixed in the brewery besides that too. <laughs> I like maybe, that. Maybe super glue then. I would buy a fur fur ring. I would buy one. <laughs> of them. All right then. Right. It's up to the next meeting where we're all together. <laughs> all right. So next, uh, we're going to cover fermentation gadgets. So these are gadgets that are used anywhere in the process of, of fermentation. Um, we've got uh, an example of a glycol chiller, uh, one of the uh, Ice Master 100s, which just looking at it just looks amazing. Um, and then we've got something called the Injectorator, which uh, will be interesting to cover. I read the description on what it is, and honestly, I, I can't tell. So we're going to have someone explain what that all is. Um, and then we've got a couple different examples of fermentation chambers that, uh, that we're going to talk about. Um, so first up, uh, Lynn, uh, she's going to talk about the uh, glycol chiller. Okay, so what you're seeing here is my setup. This is a Los Angeles apartment. This is a this is the master closet, and there there's nothing there but my fermentation chamber, and um, 
this is my um, the glycol chiller brew built more beer and then the um, brew buckets that I have going it's a new situation that I've got going on with um, the idea of having three different uh, fermentations going on at the same time and doing them individually temperature controlled. I am very excited about this glycol chiller. I have lucked out with um, just having advice on getting it organized more through more beer and also a friend, Carl, um, who is a material scientist. And I'm at this point looking to just have a fermentation situation that is the ultimate that I can do. I like the idea of having the brew buckets. I tried a unitank and I was not happy with it. And it is for sale, just so you know. Um, I try, it was, um, I like lifting heavy things. But that unit tank for me at the seven gallon situation was not good. I found it to be clumsy and I am selling it for basically at this point half the price if anyone is interested. Um, so it's an SS unit tank. I realized that my brew buckets were the ultimate in um, moving things around, cleaning, and I decided to go for a unitank, I mean, a, excuse me, a brew bucket three situation. And that's what I have going on right now. So uh, just to let everyone know, a, a glycol chiller is basically uh, uh, it's a refrigeration unit. So what you do is you cool either water or glycol, and then you pump it through um, either jacketed fermenters or uh, you know coils inside the fermenters. Wow. Um, it's used for regulating temperature so that you can set a temperature that you want you know you want your fermentation process to happen at, and it will stay there the whole time. Um, you can also use it for cold crashing. So if you need to to cold crash at certain temperatures and ramp to those temperatures, you can use the programmable controller that's on there um, to set those temperatures so that you know, it, it automates your process going forward. So my situation was that I was very, um, what, what was I gonna do with all that? Look at those lines. How am I gonna clean? Because I love to have everything super clean. Look at all those lines. What do you do? How do you take that and then um, take it away to clean it. So I am. Uh, I ordered some um, uh, I don't know what they're called, but you you basically I'm going to be cutting those lines and putting in some um, uh, oh, I don't remember what they're called, but putting all those lines that you see are going to be cut and then uh, there will be a situation where they are where I can I don't remember the name of what they're called but putting cutting the lines and then quick disconnects so that um, I am able to then do the deep cleaning that I like to do with those coils underneath the lid that you see there. That was my big concern. How do I take those coils under those lids, clean them and basically remove them to clean them? And those are under order with more beer. Any uh, questions about the glycol chiller?
Nope. Yeah, so nope. I'm curious okay. about how you control the individual fermenters. Uh, so is the glycol chiller producing three different outputs or are you controlling the flow rate to those different yes. outputs? So each, each one of these fermenters has a um, separate controller. I was used to, you know, an ink bird or some other um, controller, but when you order the um, FTS, uh, you know, with the coils on the lid, then they each each one comes with its own um, temperature controller, as you can see on the lids of each one here. I I didn't. And then the glycol chiller takes inputs from all of those. Right. And I didn't, you know, I've, okay. I'm used to ink birds or other kind of controllers. These are little, like, baby birds. And um, each one has its own ability to control the temperature. Okay, any other, any other questions? Yeah, the biggest biggest concern I had with this whole thing is how do I clean it? How do I clean those tops with the with the um, coils that um, are basically con connected to the top? And it it all had to do with a quick disconnect, and that's what you want. Well, in that case, doesn't the glycol stay within the within the tubing with no oxygen or anything else getting in right and that's what you want is the ability to clean the lids and take it away um i did get some advice about just dropping it into you know some buckets with um you know uh sanitizer but that's not enough for me i want things really clean and so um, the uh, ability to have a quick disconnect was super important. And that's what I'm working on now. All right, if there are no other questions. Well, I, I'm impressed with the fact that you could do three different beers, you know, with different temperature controls. I mean, that's fantastic. That's my goal, yes. And how long have you been using this? No, this is like in progress right now. You know, it was like, oh, I've, I have got to do a leak test. Oh no, but wait, I've got to order these, you know, quick disconnects so that I can make sure that uh, I have the ability to do cleanly, you know, clean, um, clean whatever phase I'm in. I want to know I can clean it with PBW, basically, instead of just putting it down into some, just a sanitizer. And so I'm doing that. And then um, my next step after I get those clean disconnects is to then uh, put some sort of a uh, a way to then, uh, I don't know, control the, put a, some sort of, that's, I'm sorry, I'm just not thinking of the word, but to put around the lines some sort of a way to control the, um, the temperature of what's going through the lines. So blanket, to blanket those lines so that, you know, I'm able to control the temperature as they go through the lines. It's, it's been a huge situation of learning and figuring it out, but anyway, the leak test is gonna happen after I get those quick disconnects. 
So where, where do you store your clothes? Not in that closet. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing, man. That is now the brewing closet. Exactly. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Um, well, hold on a second. Hey, Lynn, how okay. hard was it for you to get glycol to, to uh, fill that up with? Not a problem at all. So I literally, I was talking to more beer and I told them what I wanted to do. I started with this Unitank and I was just not happy with the, I just felt like it was not as useful and elegant as the brew bucket. And, um, but I had, I had thought that I would have what you see there and three unit tanks, but um, without a clean in place system, the unit tank does not make sense at the seven gallon, you know, situation. And so um, I went back to the brew bucket and it's been great. Um, and that's what I'm going to do going forward. Is glycol something that's typically hard to get down? I know you, you seem no, you just, interested that you was able to get no, it. I, I just didn't know. Okay. Yeah. So you order it and it comes. You put it in that be beautiful. Um, so you have a couple of choices. You know, the, you have, so if you order through uh, more beer, you're going to get what I've got there, which is a uh, brew built. Um, your other choice is a SS unit tank. Um, I don't, I don't have the experience to know the difference between the two. Um, that would be a very interesting conversation, but I think the, the brew bucket, I mean, excuse me, the, um, brew built is less expensive. They seem to be good at supporting it. Um, so that might be worth it when I, frankly, to be honest, when I ordered it, I thought I was getting an SS. From but, SS? Yeah. So I got that and I'm happy with it so far. All right, cool. Thank you for sharing. All right, thanks, Lynn. Uh, so next up, uh, Jack is going to talk to us about the injectorator. And, and as I mentioned, I read through his description, and I'm not quite certain how it works. So I think an explanation is definitely necessary on this one. Jack? All right, thank you. Uh, you do you like my name? It's the next uh, you know, superhero, uh, the injectorator. There should be a song to go along with it. Does it go with your outfit? Uh, it does. I, yeah, when I use this device, I, I wear my hat. You can see the bells, the jester hat. That's important. Everything's important in brewing. But the, the injectorator uh, is something that I came up with to be able to inject uh, a, sa um, a clarifying agent into my sanitized kegs. So you can kind of see by the pictures, you know, what's going on here. Um, I clean my kegs. I sanitize my kegs very well. I fill them up with sanitizer completely. I push all that sanitizer out. And so by virtue of that process, I think I've eliminated uh, all the air and oxygen in the keg. And, and I put them away uh, under CO2 pressure. And as far as I'm concerned, they're ready to go. But um, I, I typically use gelatin in most of my beers. And I did not want to open up the top of the keg and compromise the sanitation and let air and oxygen in, right? So I was saying, how do I get this gelatin into the keg when I'm draining from fermenter to keg? So I came up with this little bottle idea. And you could see the, uh, the levels, half cup, one cup, uh, slide number four is upside down. I basically fill, fill the thing up with one cup of water, warm water. I add uh, one teaspoon of gelatin per half a cup. Uh, that's good for five gallons of beer in, in my experience. So one teaspoon, half a cup, warm water, uh, five gallons. 
but I usually do 10 gallons. So I fill it up with uh, one cup of hot water, put in two teaspoons of gelatin and mix it up, stir it up nice. Then I use this uh, little carbonator cap that is a homemade deal, uh, slide number two. You punch a hole, uh, I guess number one would be a, a good, better picture. Punch a hole with the stainless steel punch, half inch into a cap that you buy on a bottled water. Heavy duty bottle would be great. Buy a standard tire valve and typically they come in number 413 and they fit a hole in a tire of 0.453. So that gets pushed in from the underside, as you can see in number two, pull it up and it snap fits. So now you have a carbonator cap. You can buy them for 20 bucks or you could buy this for 75 cents or make it for 75 cents. All right, so you need that to, to be able to pull this off. So you got this little carbonator cap that you've made and you put it on top of your bottle that you've mixed your solution in and you have a tire chuck. Look at slide number five, standard tire chuck, uh, air chuck, I should say. Uh, you, you buy that, get a couple fittings, put a piece of tubing on there and you've got a connector to your keg and uh, you've pressurized your bottle to about 20 PSI. So make sure you have a good strong bottle. So you've purged the gas out of that bottle before you pressurize it, right? No air in the little bottle of mixture. The, the keg has uh, uh, CO2 in it. Relieve the pressure on the keg. And then you basically turn the bottle upside down and you can see uh, slide number six, the one half cup mark. Y you hold the tire chuck with one hand and you push down the bottle with the solution onto the tire chuck and squeeze the bottle. Now it has 20 PSI in that bottle, so it's gonna go in that keg. Push it down till you get to the half cup mark and then do the same on your other keg. So this is the way I get my gelatin, or you could use this for anything. Uh, uh, flavorings, uh, fruit flavor, uh, tea, hop oils. This is a way to get something into your keg without opening the lid. How, how, how's that? You got the idea? Now that it's, it's explained, it is definitely clear. And it's, it's cobbling all these pieces together is, is pretty cool. You know, tire valves and, and soda bottles, you know I mean? And it, it definitely fits the purpose that it was intended for. So, you know, obviously no, nobody wants to, you know, introduce oxygen or air into their keg, right? So this is a closed system sort of a deal. So once I've got this gelatin solution into each keg, then I can force pressure transfer out of my fermenter into the keg. Uh, again, not opening the lid at all. And as the keg fills with the beer, I move the keg around and I mix that gelatin into the beer. Once it's full, I put it on the side and I rock it back and forth to make sure that gelatin mixes in with the beer. And then I put that beer in a cooler for a week and lo and behold, it takes about a week and it's almost crystal clear. I do a slow transfer directly out of the cooler. I don't move the keg. I push the beer out of that settling keg, if you will, into a final keg and carbonate it, force carbonate it, 30 PSI, roll it on the ground for two to three minutes, put it back in, and I've got carbonated beer the very next day. So that's kind of my whole total program here. Uh, but this, the carbonator cap is so useful because you can have these plastic bottles of different sizes. And so there's really kind of two, two inventions here, uh, gadgets. The carbonator cap is just awesome because I've, I've teed off on my CO2 tank, a tire chuck. And so I dispense out of a keg. I put it into whatever size bottle I want. I put the cap on, I charge it with 15 PSI and I take these bottles to a party and I don't have to drag the whole keg all over town. You could carbonate flat beer with this. It's cold beer, it's not carbonated. Put it in one of these little bottles, crank it up to 20 to 30 PSI, and again, buy strong bottles. Uh, shake it up for about a minute, minute and a half, put it back in there, come back 20 minutes later, you have carbonated beer for testing evaluation purposes. 
So this little cat thing is just amazing. So questions? Yeah, yeah, I have one question. Um, I, have, I have an example of what you're talking about right here with the carbonator cap. But the thing is, instead of using, instead of using rubber, I use a metal type of uh, grommet. Uh, air, air, what do you call these things? The, uh, this thing here. This is what I do this, yeah. It's metal on the inside. Because I heard this, I read somewhere that the, the rubber on the grommet that you use, that you have pictured there, it's poisonous. And um, they recommend using the, the stainless steel type. So I use that for that, for, uh, for carbonated um, bottles of beer. So I mean, it's just, a food, it's just food for thought. Oh yeah, I'd like to know about that. Um, you know, I, I've never had a problem over 25 years of using this little carbonator cap. <laughs> Uh, I am crazy. Maybe there is some effect there, but um, Jack, uh, the hat you're wearing, you're you're saying yes. You're, <laughs> but what I what I don't do, is, yeah, I don't let the beer contact the carbonator, the the, the tire valve. Okay, okay. Uh, it, they're upright, and it's kind of a temporary situation. You know, it's only for short term transport, if you will. And I I don't use this long term. But I'd like to see what you're talking about. If you could email me, you know, that stainless steel, I'd like to consider that. Yeah. You have to find that because I, I made this cap a couple of years ago also, and I, I read that somewhere. So I've, I've been cautious about that for the past couple of years. But I'll, I'll see if I can find it for you, and I'll just email it to you. Yeah, th thank you. You know, uh, obviously this is not food grade, you know, stuff, but uh, – yeah. You know, kind of a st standard size. Um, these are these are really handy. If you if you lose them, you know, it's seventy five cents. It's no big deal. Commercial ones like this uh, are fifteen to twenty bucks. So um, right. this was actually uh, I got to give credit to Bill Sobieski. Remember Andy? Uh, he came to our, one of our meetings twenty five years ago with yeah. with the carbonator cap idea. Yeah, and uh, you know I've been using them ever since. But uh, once again, you could use this technique to inject anything in, into your beer, what, whatever it may be. So it's not limited. I've been just, using this to carbonate things, but I didn't really, I never thought about injecting things into the keg. So I think that's a great, that's a great idea to be able to inject things into the keg. Yeah, I just want to, I want to keep that lid closed, you know, no, never open it, right? Jack, you know, what I'll say is I've, I've used yours for the ones you gave me, you gave me a couple of years and years ago. I've used them for many parties. It's been great. I, I think you're right. You just use it right before you're going to need it. And it's, uh, you know, make sure it's pressurized and it's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. So there you go, Andre. Cool. Thank you, Jack. Any other questions about the injectorator? Would injectorator have been better to call this? I, I think it would. Uh, you're right. I'm to rename it this is undergoing trademark uh, and patent uh, you know filings and everything so thank you good call, good call jack i think that's required good thank you <laughs> changing the name jack that wouldn't that cause problems because you've already got it labeled on the uh on your container right here you'd have to change that label well it's, it's just a prototype you know it's a 20 year prototype but <laughs> <laughs> well you better make sure all of us signed our ndas before you do anything <laughs> Yeah. Hey, thanks, uh, Andre, for putting this together. I appreciate it. Yeah, Actually, thank you. Andre, I think you should edit the slide and just call it the Injacerator. I think okay. it's, it's done. All right. I'll, I'll make sure to do that and send the updated slides out to everybody. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So uh, the next uh, item we're going to talk about is a uh, home-built fermentation chamber. Uh, this is something that we've got in our, in our brewery. Um, basically, we took an old fridge, uh, and we have a... Uh, a custom designed Raspberry Pi uh, temperature controller on it. Um, we're uh, using the fridge in normal fridge mode. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is able to uh, turn on and off the fridge to regulate the cooling. And then in instances like in the middle of winter where we may need a little bit of extra heat in there, it also turns on and off a light bulb that we've got inside a paint can so that we can basically monitor a, a precise temperature. Um, down at the bottom is a picture of what the actual controller setup looks like. Um, for people who aren't familiar, Raspberry Pi is a little single board, uh, little single computer, single board computer, uh, fairly small. Um, this has a, a relay, a relay module on it that is able to basically switch on and off AC. Uh, so it will turn on and off either the heater or the fridge itself. 
Um, we do all of our graphing and our control uh, through Google Sheets. Um, and actually, we use a variation on this particular setup for a couple other items that we're gonna, I'm going to talk about later on. Um, and then I'll, I'll do a, a little bit of in-depth on our, our heating and controlling system for this. So this is just kind of a, a teaser and one example of what we're using. So now we're going to move on to conditioning and serving gadgets. Uh, we've got a, uh, a homemade keyser. Uh, we've got a couple different examples of bottle cappers, uh, which now for the homebrew exchange, uh, capping bottles is something that we're all doing again. We, most of us had kind of gotten, unless you're in competitions, had gotten away from it. And, you know, we're mainly kegging, so kind of a throwback to the to the brewing of old. Um, and then we've got uh, some cold rooms. Uh, we've got an example of a purchased controller. And then a couple different examples of cool rooms that, that have been built uh, by people. So uh, Keyser. Uh, so this is an example of, of what we have set up in our place. Uh, basically, it's a chest freezer. Um, we uh, stick our kegs down in there. We're using the same variation on our Raspberry Pi control setup to uh, turn on and off the Keyser to regulate its temperature so it never ends up freezing. Um, down at the bottom, uh, we've got an LCD, uh, an LED display, excuse me. Uh, that displays the current temperature, whether it's cycling on and off. Uh, and again, this is another another uh, Raspberry Pi controlled thing, so we'll, we'll cover that further. Um, our future addition for this is uh, doing a custom built collar around the side so that we can have our taps instead of just using standard taps. All right, bottle cappers. Uh, so everybody's familiar with this little red guy. Um, you know, this is the first capper that pretty much all of us have used. Um, when you buy your beginning, you know, introduction to homebrew kit, you know, you get your buckets, you get your your first carboys, and you get one of these red spring-loaded monstrosities. Um, they take a lot of practice to use. You end up, you know, going to clamp it down and shooting a bottle across your brewery. Um, honestly, they're not very good, which is why people upgrade. So there are a couple different options in, in bottle cappers. Um, there are ones that you can buy that are self-contained units um, that are basically big presses. Um, but it, one that we've been using uh, recently is basically a uh, machined piece of stainless steel that fits in a standard drill press. So you take your bottle and put it on your drill press stand with your cap on it, and then you uh, chuck this uh, die into it and then run your drill press down. The drill press is off, so you're, you're not actually powering the drill press, you're just using it as a press in this instance. Um, and you, you press your caps down. Um, in terms of you know, ease of use, I mean, this has gotta be pretty much the easiest way to do it. Um, the only downside with one of these is you have to make sure you've got a flat, non-slip surface. Um, so usually what we'll do is we'll put a piece of wood down on the metal drill press stand and then we'll put a piece of uh, the non-slip uh, non -slip shelf liners that you would use, the kind of like corrugated looking thing. It's got a little bit of tack to it. Um, that way, as you're pressing down, you don't end up shooting a bottle across. And especially if you've, you know, your bottles are a little wet um, and your surface is a little wet, everything gets slippery and you can end up shooting that bottle out. So um, does anyone else have any examples of, of bottle cappers that, that they've used in the past? Um, anything that's that you know, you can give a recommendation to the group. Well, Andre, I'll tell you that, uh, I mean, I like to, uh, to have a basically a tabletop capper for most of my capping things, but I've got, um, I've got a, a, uh, uh, hand cappers for like when you're just doing a small number of things and, and or if I've got, uh, the, the larger European bottle caps that I might be using. So I've got, some other cappers for that. And I've really been into uh, my corker these days, doing a lot of corking. Now on, on the, the corkers that are their own thing, do they have attachments where you could flip it over and do bottles or are they just purpose built to be corkers at that point? No, they're purpose built for corkers, but you can, you can change, you can adjust things to, to do wine corks where you would want to drive the cork all the way through. Uh -huh or Belgian beer corks where you only want to drive them in, you know, roughly half. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other suggestions or recommendations for bottle cappers? You know, one thing uh, that I've done accidentally, uh, especially if I've used some fairly cheap, thin bottle material, I've actually broken bottles uh, because I pressed too hard. They fracture okay. and it, it's, it's a real mess. 
So, you know, having some little cushioning, you know, underneath the bottle and getting kind of a feel, you know, practice, but actually use the thickest bottles that you could find, quite honestly, yeah. to give yourself a little bit of uh, uh, tolerance <laughs> for error. Yeah, definitely. And the non-slip surface does have, a, it's kind of spongy, um, if you, you felt it at all. Um, so that does give a little bit, but yeah, if you're not adjusted correctly and you, you, you know, think you have a lot less throw set up that you actually do as you go and run it down, you could very easily, you know, crack or shatter a bottle at that point. So very big. Yeah. Yeah. So be, be careful. Andre, yes. Andre, I, have a, I have a question. Sure. Um, or maybe it's a question and suggestion. I, I have a, my, my bottle capper is a standalone, um, purpose built. Yeah. But uh, you got muted there, Lauren. Lauren, get muted. Yeah, you're mute. You're still still muted. I think he's. There you go. I'm okay. Now you're good. You're back. People need to start stop changing my setting. Anyway, <laughs> um, purpose built bottle capper. Um, um, a single unit with a big arm on it, um, adjustable height. Um, but one of the things that I'm that I I really like about it that I'm not seeing with your drill press version is that the the cap actually has, there's a magnet in the in the sealer portion on that that holds the cap up so that um, I can cap on foam when I'm capping. So uh, with, with your setup, I would be concerned about not being able to cap on foam. Yeah, and that, I, I can definitely see where that concern would be. Um, there is not a magnet inside of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it would, you'd, you'd kind of have to, it would be a balancing act to get it all work. So I don't, that may not be a good solution for this particular thing. And you know, the downside of this is you gotta have a drill press handy. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of people are brewing in their garage where they might have one, you know, yeah. but if you don't, then then yeah, a standalone capper like you use would definitely be the way to go. Or I, if you're I wanting wish, to cap on foam. Yeah, I wish I had a drill press. And if if I did, I would like to use something exactly like this, but I think I would um, um, put in a recess magnet in the top. Uh, just to and, and that may be possible to do. Um, I've actually got it sitting on my desk over there. I, I should have brought it and had it in front of me. But it um, it, it is pretty deep on the on the inside of it. Um, so it may be possible to, uh, you know, glue or epoxy a magnet yep. underneath there so that it would hold the cap tight to it. Um, I don't remember exactly where we bought this one. Uh, when I did s the search for getting the information about this today, um, I didn't see any of them with magnets in it, but I, you know, it makes a lot of sense. So, um, you know, that, that may be something that's definitely possible. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, any, any other capper suggestions? All right. So uh, we're gonna talk about a couple different cold rooms. Uh, so I wanna mention um, uh, CoolBot. Um, this is a, a commercial uh, product that you can get for doing uh, cold rooms, fermentation chambers, things where you need to, to closely monitor and regulate temperatures. Um, this one is about $400. Uh, you get an app with it. Uh, it allows you to control it. Um, part of what CoolBot does, um, and, and we use a variation of, of, how, of its methodology in our home, in our home built setup, is that um, it works with a standard air conditioning unit. So when it wants to tell the air conditioner unit to get cold, it actually fools the air conditioner by heating up a little element which makes the air conditioner think, oh, it's too hot. I need to trigger my cooling mode. So that's how you're able to fool the air conditioner in a run, into running for a lot longer, which will drive the temperature a lot lower. Um, this one's Wi-Fi enabled. It's got you know, an app for iOS and Android. Um, it's definitely a, a solution for people who don't want to, don't want to basically build their own. So uh, we got a homemade cool room here. Uh, Dennis is gonna talk us uh, through this one. Uh, this is one that he built. Yes, thank you. So the sure. best part about building my cold room is that um, I asked my neighbor for some advice and he built it for me. So that was the best part about building the cold room. It's about six inches walls, outdoor do uh, exterior door, um, and uh, it does a really good job wrap it with polyurethane so you don't get uh, too much humidity uh, flowing in. 
but the um, cooling mechanism. So what I did, I uh, actually got the build instructions through Kubot uh, for their University of Kentucky um, cold room they built as my model. It's only about three and a half feet deep because that was all that we could use in the garage and still get two vehicles in the garage. Uh, so that was all the space I had, five and a half feet wide, eight feet tall. Um, holds a lot, but uh, it would be nicer if it was a little bit bigger to be able to walk, walk into it, but you can't. But if all, and in reference to the coolant, uh, is a Johnson controller that I had for my Keyser. Um, and then I have a reptile cable that is connected to the Johnson controller and the heat from the uh, reptile heat cable is wrapped around the thermostat for the air conditioning unit. And just like Andre was saying, when uh, uh, the um, temperature gets above whatever degree I have it set at, which is about 43, the um, uh, Johnson controller kicks on, the heat cable um, warms up, the air conditioning turns on, and you're cooled back down. The interesting thing is how cold an air conditioning unit can actually get in an enclosed space. I um, just plugged mine in one when we were building it, and we unplugged it when it got down to 28 degrees. So some people say, well, how can an air conditioning unit keep it that cold? Well, those things are damn cold. Um, so you can actually get it down to whatever temperature you want. So my cost other than the air conditioning unit was reptile heat cable at a cost of about $27 and the uh, controller that I already had as far as controlling the, uh, the temperature. And it works really good. Only have to watch out every once in a while, the air conditioning unit does freeze up and you hope it doesn't freeze up too much because I have had to replace an air conditioning unit. And that's a pain because they keep changing the sizes of air conditioning units which means that you have to change the size of your air conditioning hole, um, which is really hard when you've got six inches of insulation in there. Yep, so. we've, we've, we've had similar problems. It fits pretty easily. I think we have nine kegs in there usually on the yeah. left side, and then right inside the door is a shelving unit that's probably three feet wide, and then the whole height of the room that we have all the bottles on. Yeah. So Dennis, I've, I've uh, looked into this before and I've seen there's a difference between digital and analog uh, uh, air conditioning units. Have you had a problem? Which kind do you have? I really have no idea. Uh, it's an LG. This one's an LG. The first one was a GE. And um, I don't know if it's an analog or a digital. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, I have no idea. It was a cheap one, 199 bucks at uh, Walmart. All Is right. Window, air, window AC systems then? It's just a basic window AC system, yeah. So did it, what did it cost to actually build the, uh, the room out? Was that expensive or was that pretty low cost or? It was, the main cost, I mean, all you have is wood and um, insulation. And my guess is when I put it together with the air conditioning unit and everything was probably about $1,000. Okay. And the reason I built it, I've got um, back issues and I'm an old man. And um, lifting those kegs into a keyser, especially when you have an eight inch wood collar on it is a lot of a lot of work and uh, I don't know if you can see the lines hanging down there um, those little black, the black lines uh, that's what I use to uh, their little winches that I use to lift up my kegs and stuff back when it was a keyser day and I still use for my fermenter to uh, uh, elevate to um, gravity fill my kegs um, so but uh, yeah I I hated picking those things up and putting them in the uh, teaser. That was why I built the cold room. So that's a whole nother gadget you'll have to show us for a whole nother day. <laughs> <laughs> but talking about other gadgets in, uh, in reference to uh, dispersing beer, I also have a very trick uh, mobile um, 
uh, distribution system, which is basically just a piece of plywood, nicely stained, with two towers on it and three tap handles to be able to take and put on any trash can to turn a trash can into a nice um, tank system. Do you nice, have to uh, put beer in it, or do you just the trash turns into good beer? <laughs> the trash turns into great beer. They just put your kegs in it. So basic recycle keg. Uh, I mean, recycle um, rolling uh, trash, trash can, can yeah. holds three uh, current kegs beautifully. Um, throw a little ice in there, or I've got cooler bags, and uh, they turn into great uh, taps for parties, for uh, weddings and birthdays, and three kegs will travel. Nice. All right, thanks, Dennis. Um, so uh, second cold room. So this is an example of a cold room that we built uh, for our sake brewing. Uh, we do ferment beer in there also when we need to. Um, the build is, is very similar to Dennis's. Uh, you can see uh, it's a window mounted air conditioner. Um, we've got ours. Ours is approximately, I wanna say it's six feet by 12 feet. Um, it's uh, semi portable. Uh, we made it so it would fit on a car trailer. Um, so when we, when we start up our sake brewery and actually are in a facility, we can transport it and use it there. Um, it's got, uh, it's Raspberry Pi controlled like our other ones. Um, we've got a monitor on the front that shows some graphing on it. Um, inside we've got racks. Uh, and if you can see in the picture there, um, we've got our latest batch of sake that it, when I took the pictures were, were happily, uh, conditioning along. Um, Inside, uh, we've got uh, foam insulation, um, and it's a, a metal studded uh, building. So we've got the foam insulation on there. Right now, the outside isn't insulated, um, so just the inside is, but we're pretty thick on the insulation, so it, it, keeps, you know, it keeps cold in there with very little loss. Um, we have had, as Dennis mentioned, we've, we've had to replace our air conditioner also, uh, which you know, once you get everything all sealed around it you know, to make sure you're not leaking any air, Having to cut all that away and pull the AC unit out and put another one in can be a problem. Um, I think ours ended up freezing up, and that's that's why it ended up dying. So, um, you know, very very similar to what he did, um, we're able to to keep our temperature um, pretty consistent throughout the throughout the season. Um, what, so, as I mentioned before, uh, we've got a Raspberry Pi running it. Um, we wrote a bunch of custom Python code, and we're using uh, Google Sheets. So uh, all the data is uh, basically sent up to the cloud so we can monitor uh, the temperature from wherever we are. Um, it also sends us text messages. So if for some reason the uh, cold room goes offline um, and it's not, able to, it's not able to detect any of the, the sensors that we have in there, it'll alert us so we can know that something's wrong. Um, so let's, uh, I've got a bounce out of this here and bring up the Google Sheet that we have, just so you guys can see the, that's not the right one. So you guys can see an example of what the graphing looks like. Um, so this is, uh, this is a graph starting back, it looks like the beginning of March. Um, so we're looking at uh, essentially, you know, two months worth of data here. Um, I gotta slide a window over here so I can tell you what everything is. Um, so we got a bunch of different lines on here. Uh, the real ones that you should be uh, concerned about are, we've got a chamber temperature one. So that's basically telling us um, the consistency of, of the temperature in there. Well, you can see when the AC cycles on, you get some dips. Um, but we can see you know, spikes. Like if you look towards the end here, um, you know, the past week it's gotten hot. So you can see that, that the temperature on the outside, which is this orange line, has gone up. And then you end up seeing a resulting spike in the air conditioner temperature because it needs to run longer to keep up. And so it's putting all the data here in a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet's just going through and graphing it. We do have some control over this in one of our other installations where we're able to um, change some settings by changing settings on here. Um, we can uh, adjust what the heating and cooling cycles are for uh, our fermentation chamber. Um, you can change the set points in here and it ripples through down to the Raspberry Pi and sets them there. So um, we had looked at some off the shelf solutions. Uh, you know, there's the Inkbird controllers, there's some Honeywell controllers, some Johnson controllers, but none of them kind of had the granularity that we wanted. Um, you know, we're a bunch of engineers and we like to over engineer things and 
you know, we like to be able to control and look at every little thing. So um, this basically gives us, you know, gives us the granularity that we're requiring for this. Um, and I'm sure some of it's overkill, but it's graphs and numbers and it looks real pretty. So that's why we like it. Yeah, Andre, two questions. Yeah. What model of Pi and do you have, do you have any of that Python code available? Um, uh, right now the Python code's not online, but it's something that we can definitely, definitely talk about. Um, everything right now are running on Pi 3s. Um, I think we may even have some Pi 2s that are running it. Um, it doesn't take a lot of horsepower to run. Uh, what we're finding though is that the, um, some of the backend uh, API code that we use is a little finicky and likes the newer pies versus the older pies. Um, we're trying to work on getting an installation package together because when we've had to make new ones for, for other uses, having to get all the little bits and pieces together and finding the right versions is a problem. So we want to make an installation package. So eventually, you know, if you know, you're interested in that, we can provide you with one thing as opposed to having to find 10 different packages to get it to work. So my background's a programmer and this is something I'm looking at now that I, I have time. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a, a lot of us are finding that we have time to work on projects we didn't have before. So, yeah, but yeah, definitely. I mean, we're, we're more than happy to share some of this information with you guys. Thank you very much. Sure. So I believe that that actually wraps it up. Um, so, uh, just a quick open discussion. I know we're kind of running up to the, uh, well, we're, we're almost at nine o'clock here. Um, so are there any other gadgets, uh, that any of you guys think should absolutely be discussed? Um, I know we kind of covered some other additional ones in between, but is there anything that is just screaming at you guys that absolutely has to be, has to be included? Uh, I did have two things I wanted to share. If sure. Have just a couple minutes. Yeah. Uh, one second, let me grab them. Uh, I don't know if I can commandeer the video. It isn't a here. gadget, but we cool from our spa. So we never waste any water uh, in cooling our beer. So we run a sump pump from the spa through the um, counterflow chiller to cool everything. And then run it back into the spa. Uh, I know my video is kind of small at the moment. Um, uh, sometimes there's an output on your pool pump. So this right here, let me actually. So the pool is a big thermal mass. So whatever temperature that is, when you're circulating it through your wort, it's, it's going to try and maintain that same thermal mass in the pool. But you're so doing it from cool. the spa. The spa is warmer. So well, you're just bringing it down from the boiling temperature to the spa. Well, but if the spa is no, it's not cool. heated all the time. So it's usually about 70 degrees. Oh, OK. We just heat it when we use it. Great idea. You, you, you mean you just use it after you brew? Exactly. <laughs> so you're saying you heat it up so that after you brew, you can get in. Right, yes. correct. And the more you Derek, brew, the warm it'll be. Derek, what are you showing us? All right, so uh, I know my screen is kind of small right now, unless you swap the shared screen. So this is my uh, quick and easy uh, growler and bottle filler. So what I have here is my picnic tap. And then this is my bottling wand. And through the magic of science and alchemy, I cram it into the tip of the bottling or the cobra tap here. And just like that, I have a device to extract beer from my keg and insert it into another device. So um, like if this is a bottle, I just kind of like plunk it down and then uh, open the cobra tap there and then it will fill it up. And when I'm done, I just pull it out, and then I have a perfectly uh, simply bottled uh, bottle or growler. And so I tried for a long time to try to fill things out of my tap through like a tap connection device. And I feel like that never really worked out like the way I hoped it would. Um, but I found that if you just cram a bottling wand into a picnic or a cobra tap, 
uh, that works pretty good. So <laughs> I, uh, I would, I want to say maybe like 80% of homebrew competitions that I bottle for, this is how I fill my bottles. And, uh, I've never once gotten a comment about oxidized beer. So it works pretty good. Uh, So Derek, the thing I do is I cap on foam. I think that's the real important thing. So Derek, beers that have showed up at the exchange, have you done them with that bottling? Oh yeah, that's how it was bottled. <laughs> okay, there you go. I it's great because I can I can pull beer out of a keg and have a bottle in like the time it takes me to sanitize the bottle. It's so fast and easy. That yeah. So Derek, ever since I've learned that you did that, I've I've done that several times. And I agree with you. It's like it's a very easy, quick way to to fill a bottle, and then you can cap it on foam like Kelsey does, and it works great. Uh, the only thing is that I turn uh, I turn the pressure down to like maybe six psi, just so it feels real slow. But I would be doing that even if I was using like my beer gun. So um, that's kind of just a standard practice. Do you? So um, carb your beers a little higher because you're going to lose some during that process or? Um... Yeah, I, I would say I maybe just do like the higher end of whatever style. Mm -hmm. um, I personally kind of like a spritzier beer most of the time. So um, that way when I bottle it, it's kind of what people expect. But the thing is when you bottle it, the way that you're saying is that you minimize like the, the amount of carbonation that comes out of solution. So you can cap on something that's fully carbonated, even with the foam top. And then when you pull the cap off and pour it later, it's still the way that you wanted it to be when you bottled it. And so, yeah, so what I do is, cause it's a bottling wand, it's actually like kind of finely tuned so that when you pull it out of the bottle, you have just the right amount of headspace. And then what I do is, I kind of take the tip at the entrance and then give it one last little squirt and it'll squirt out some foam that will fill that top part. And then I put the cap on and that gives me that cap on foam that is real good. Did you do it, Derek, did you do anything with the bottom of that? Because a lot of times those things have agitators on them that agitate it and drive out CO2 or? Uh, no, it's just, a, I mean, it's literally just a standard bottling wand. I've done nothing to it other than I, I just made sure that it's the right diameter for uh, the tap. Hole. Very cool. And then the other thing I wanted to share with you is a system that I use for my CO2. And it's a quick disconnect. And so these are called um, Kent quick connects or Kent fittings. They sell them at more beer. And so what I do is um, I put female fittings on everything connected to uh, like a CO2 tank. And then I put male fittings on everything else. And so what I have is a bunch of varying lengths of um, kind of like CO2 ends. And then I also have uh, things I can connect to my uh, carboy transferring and my bottling gun and just about anything you can think of. So instead of having to swap out various ends and connections, I just create I just create these own little short connector pieces. And when I say when I when I switch to a uh, ball lock to a pin lock, I just pop that cable off and then I pop my pin lock cable on. And then that way I can use one CO2 tank kind of all over my house without having to reconnect a bunch of things. So I'll, I'll post the link to the, the Kent fittings um, on the, the Facebook page, but it's, it's just a super easy way to like rapidly swap out a bunch of different connections for CO2. You can probably use it in other places, but it works really good for CO2. Derek, don't forget to use the fur for every time you change your tube. Yeah, I'm excited now. I, <laughs> I, I posted in chat at one point, they're like, are you really a brewer if you don't have a permanent indentation in your index? <laughs> so, 
Way to sell it, Lauren. Way to sell it. <laughs> hey, Derek, I'm going to hit you up. That sounds, I need more details on that. Because there's so many times where I'm trying to switch from this to that and, you know, to, to pump CO2 in the bottom of the keg and then you got to switch it over to properly carbonate the keg and all this. That's a really great idea. So I'm going to hit you up. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so I just use these little, uh, I forget the name of them, these little like screw clamps to make sure that all my fittings are on tight. But like I, I juice this thing up to like 50 PSI sometimes and I, it never leaks. So it's, it's pretty good. Like they pop right on and off and they're still real good connections. So nice. Cool. Any other last minute gadgets that people want to share? Yeah, actually, uh, well, I don't know if my, my video doesn't seem to be on. Hold on. There we go. All right. So uh, before there were the ink birds, we used to make our own temperature controllers and we'd buy them separately online and they looked just like the ink bird stuff, uh, but we would wire them in ourselves. And these are just like uh, like on off toggle switches in, in, in line. It comes with the temperature probe and you just wire the thing up just like an on off switch in line and it keeps your uh, wort and whatever else you want at the right temperature. Dan, but now you have ink bird, so no Dan, one makes you still have it in more. the package and everything, right? I mean, is that like from the eighties or what? Well, I've got like three of them that I use and this is just an extra one that I had within reach that I could show everyone. Got it. It's the spare. <laughs> <laughs> or the unused one. The nice thing about those are that you can, people, you just cut a hole in your collar of your chest freezer and you can install it right in the collar. So, uh -huh. like those little controllers you can install somewhere. Uh, these days, the Inkbirds are running 28 bucks with all the wiring and it's a pretty good deal. Yeah. I think this and was, uh, I think this was like $20 when I bought it. I don't know how many years ago. Um, but they worked well. And yes, I use a, uh, one of these for my uh, Keyser to keep it at the right temperature so it doesn't freeze everything solid. All right, anybody else? Going once, going twice. All right, I think we already hit questions. So if anybody's got any specific questions about things that I've covered, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, either you know, post a message on the club or uh, shoot me an email. Okay, listen, before uh, Andre goes, I want a, a big thank you right here. I mean, a, a large virtual uh, applause right here for, for uh, this uh, presentation. This is really nice to see all these gadgets. Uh, thank you very much, Andre, for putting this all together. It was great to see a lot of the information that you brought to the table and then uh, from a lot of your friends that you were able to, to uh, bring in on the presentation as well. So I really appreciate it. Sure, There's no problem. Like you said, well, this will be up on the uh, on our website. We'll get this information up. We are recording this information, so we'll put that recording uh, somewhere where it's accessible. And uh, we'll also we're going to go into a, the next thing we're going to do is go into a happy hour or an, a you know post presentation uh, a social time. We'll stop the recording so you guys can you know all get crazy and things like that. But uh, I just want to thank you all for uh, attending this. I want to thank you, Andre, for uh, putting this all together. Yeah, and just a, a quick thank you to the, the people who volunteered their gadgets and, and volunteered to talk about them. Um, you know, it's definitely good to get, you know, what other people are actually using instead of just, you know, a bunch of research, research and the few gadgets that I use myself. So uh, thank you to Jacques, Lynn, Dennis, Jack, and Lauren. Yeah, awesome. Thank Excellent. you, Andre. Okay.